Grab your Bible. Will you do that? We're going to get back in the book of Joshua, chapter 14 today. Uh, Joshua, chapter 14, I really believe <clears throat> with all my heart that we have a message from the Lord uh, from this chapter. As we continue this series, uh, how many of you have been blessed just by reading and studying this book? I know I have. I've learned so much. And uh, today we're going to look at uh, a man in Joshua chapter 14 that is a testimony of God's faithfulness in his life. This series is entitled God's Faithfulness and Our Obedience. God is faithful to us even when many times we're fickle, right? And we're not faithful to him. He's always faithful to us. Well, today the message is actually entitled A Testimony of Faithfulness. And what we're going to see is we're going to see that God is faithful to Caleb while Caleb is faithful to God. Caleb's testimony is still speaking to us today. His life is bearing witness to us today. I remind you that your life is a testimony. Your life is a witness. What kind of testimony are you giving today to the people around you? What kind of witness are you giving on your job? What kind of witness, young people, are you giving in your school? Are people looking at your life and are they saying they have a testimony of grace? They have a testimony of Jesus? They have a testimony of the gospel? Or would it be a testimony of something else? I think about Jesus as he <clears throat> is about to ascend back into heaven. In Acts chapter 1, he says to his disciples, but you will be my witnesses. You will be witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. You're going to go out in this region, and ultimately this message is going to make it to the ends of the earth. That's you and me, by the way. We are the ends of the earth. The gospel has made it to us. And so now we are in the pipeline, in the lineage, if you will, of the family of God. We are the witnesses of the mercy and the grace of the Lord Jesus. There's one more important detail I want to point out for you. Is that word witnesses there in Acts chapter 1, verse number 8? The Greek word, it's, it's uh, translated testimony. It's also translated witness or witnesses in the Scripture. That word is actually the same word for which we get in our English language to be a martyr, a martyr. So when the disciples heard that word, they were hearing their Lord and Savior say to them, some of you are going to die in Jerusalem. Some of you are going to die in Judea. Some of you are going to die in Samaria, and then others are going to die to the ends of the earth. The question I have for you now, as we know that the disciples, many of them lost their life for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I ask you now in this moment, when the hour is urgent, are you willing to give your life for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ? More importantly, if that's not the moment, if that's not going to happen in this hour, the question for us today is not will we die for him, but will we truly live for him? Joshua chapter 14, a testimony of faithfulness in the man named Caleb. Will you look at it with me? We come to this section now where the land is divided we're west of the Jordan River. Chapter 13 talked about the land east of the Jordan River. Now we're on the west side as the land is going to be distributed. Look at verses 1 through 5 uh, just by way of introduction. These are the inheritances that the people of Israel received in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers' houses of the tribes of the people of Israel gave them to inherit. Their inheritance was by lot, just as the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine and one-half tribes. For Moses had given an inheritance 
to the two and a half tribes beyond the Jordan, but to the Levites he gave no inheritance among them. For the people of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, and no portion was given to the Levites in the land, but only cities to dwell in, with pasture lands for their livestock and their substance. The people of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. They allotted the land. Now, this is, of course, a narrative of the moment, right, and how it was done. I want to be sure to show you that what's happening here in these five verses, this is not the plan of man. Man did not devise what I just read for you. They are actually following the command and the detail that was given to them by God. Eleazar is the son of Aaron. He is the priest. He was there in Numbers chapter 27 when Joshua was commissioned as the man uh, to replace Moses. In Numbers chapter 34, there is the command of Eleazar and Joshua to distribute the land, to call out the heads of the different tribes, and to actually distribute the land. It was God that told them they would distribute the land by lot, or by casting of lots. Now that makes us nervous, right? The casting of lots. We see that over and over in the scripture. You remember in the book of Hebrews when uh, the two goats were brought for the sacrifice, uh, there was one of them uh, that would be sacrificed on the altar, but the other one was the scapegoat that got sent out into the wilderness to uh, signify, of course, our sin being cast away, never to be seen again. How was that determined? Which goat would be sacrificed and which would go free? It was by the casting of lots. God says to Moses, when you get ready to divvy out the land, I want you to cast lots. Now, you and I know that's not a good way to make family decisions today, right? Uh, to get some dice. And so we, we, we try to ask the question, why would God do this? And, and this is the simple answer for us today. Uh, when God casts the lots, it's in his divine will and purpose, and it's going to land exactly the way he wants it to land. So God is in control. Even though he's telling them to cast the lot, God is still directing in his divine will the purposes of the land. Uh, I would add to that, he told them uh, that you will determine the parcels of land, uh, not only just by the casting of the lot, but also by the size of the tribe. And so they did exactly as the Lord commanded uh, for the nine and a half tribes. One more important detail is the handling of the tribe of Levi, the Levites. Now, a few weeks ago, I mentioned to you that in the land of Canaan, there were 48 uh, what we would call Levitical cities. The Levites were not given a, a county, if you will, or a chunk of land but rather they were given cities, and those cities just outside uh, would have pasture land for them to uh, graze and take care of their cattle. What I want you to see about the Levites, the question is, why did the Levites not receive their own parcel of land? Well, when we look at the number of tribes, the number is 12. And Joshua 14 here tells us that the, the people of Joseph were two tribes, that's the tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim. Therefore, no portion was given to the Levites. Now, there's something important here that I want to kind of drive home for just a second. Why did the Levites not receive land? Many writers, many scholars say this. The Levites did not receive land because they were the spiritual leaders of the people of God. God wanted them to be pointing the people back to worship. God wanted the Levites to be pointing the people back to the law, back to him. He did not want their focus to be on the land or material possessions. He wanted their focus to be on the Lord. Now, the message that they gave was a message that all 12 tribes needed to hear. This land that we are occupying, it is not about the land, but rather it's about the Lord. It's about us keeping our eyes on him. And so the land is divided up, verse number five, the people in obedience by the command of Moses, they allotted the land. And now we move into the section I want to spend a minute with you 
uh, which is 6, verse 6 through the end of the chapter, as we see a great guy who appears on the scene. He's a great God. He's a great guy because he has a great God. His name is Caleb. Let's look at this man's life for just a minute. Can we do this? And we're going to see in verse number 6 that he steps forward and he begins to talk about the testimony of his life, what God had done for him and in him and through him. Here's his testimony. Verses 6 through 9, Caleb gives a testimony of courage. Read verse number 6 with me. Then the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jehunah the Kenizzite said to him, so Caleb is speaking to Joshua, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God in Kadesh Barnea concerning you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. Yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever, because you wholly followed the Lord my God. I love that testimony there that Caleb gives as he actually takes us back 45 years. I believe two of the most important chapters in all of the Old Testament is Numbers chapter 13 and 14. As a matter of fact, there are several places in the New Testament where you're reading that passage in context that you have to jump back over to Numbers chapter 13 and 14 to get its context. As a matter of fact, we saw that several times when we were going through the book of Hebrews. What happened? Moses takes one person from each of the 12 tribes and he sends them into the land of Canaan to spy out the land. He wants them to go look around, uh, to size things up, and to bring back uh, what they discover in the land. He says to them, Numbers chapter 13, verse 17, that he sends them out in the hill country and he says, I want you to see what the land is. I want you to find out whether the people are weak or strong, whether there are few or there are many. I want you to find out, is the land good or is it bad? Find out if the cities are fortified or if the people are just in camps spread out in the open. Come back and let us know, is the land rich or poor? Let us know if there are any trees in it. And then he makes this statement. He says to the spies, be of good courage. And when you come back, bring us some fruit from the land. You read the end of Numbers chapter 13, and it says they chose to bring back some, some grapes, some figs, and some pomegranates. A matter of fact, the grapes that they chose to bring back, they were so big that they needed poles to carry them on the shoulders of the men. I mean, this is a visual object lesson of how great it is over there, right? And they come back and they show them the, the figs and the pomegranates, and they say, no doubt, no doubt, this is a rich land. This is a fertile land. But when you come to Numbers 13, 28, after giving this report, there is a word I want you to see and circle in your Bible. The word is, the ten spies say, however, however. Yeah, it looks great over there. No doubt it's a fertile land. No doubt it would be a great place to live and inhabit. However, however the people that dwell in the land, they're strong. The cities are fortified. They're large. Not only that, it's not only people living there, but the descendants of Anak. You know this if you grew up in Sunday school. In other words, they're giants in the land. They're big. They're tall. They're strong. And we just can't do it. We can't accomplish this. Now, what is the problem with this church? The problem is these ten spies are not resting 
in the promise of God. When God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. It doesn't matter how big they are. It doesn't matter how many of them there are. This is the land that God has promised his people. But yet, 10 of the 12 bring back a negative report, and Caleb said it there in Joshua 14, and it melted the heart of the people. So as this report is given to the crowd, notice on the screen here, Numbers chapter 13 and verse number 30. There's a man that steps forward. (laughs) His name is Caleb. But Caleb quieted the people. I can just see maybe Caleb did the old Alabama, you know, country boy whistle, right? I can't do it, but all this stuff's going on, all this noise, and people are upset and emotional, and, and they, we'll see this in a minute. I mean, the people do not receive this report well. There's grumbling. There's talking already. And Caleb said, hey, hold on. Everybody listen up a minute. He quieted them before Moses, and he said this. Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. How did the people respond? Yeah, good idea, Caleb. Let's do that. Nope, verse 31, the men who had gone up with him, they came back again and said, we are not able to go up against this people for they are stronger than we. So they brought the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy it out, it is a land that devours its inhabitants. They're going to eat us alive. That's the report we have. And all the people that we saw in it are of great height. There we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, that come from Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. A negative report. Always be mindful of this. If you're a negative Nelly, you're going to affect the people around you. If you're living, being paralyzed by fear and anxiety and negativity, you are going to sap the spiritual energy from people around you. And that's exactly what happens here. We go into chapter 14, and what does it say the people start doing? They start wailing and crying. I mean, they're upset, and their emotions turn toward anger, toward Moses and toward Aaron, and they point their finger at them. What have you done to us? Why have you brought us here? You brought us to this point, and if we follow you and do what you're telling us to do, we are all going to die by the sword. And as the people are wailing, Scripture says that Joshua and Caleb tore their clothes. A sign of mourning. You know why they tore their clothes? This was another moment of realization that they believed God and they trusted God and they were following God, but they were just around a bunch of people that didn't get it. You ever feel that way? Or like looking at me. You ever feel that way? Just don't get it. And they begin to try their best to speak to the people and say, would you please stop it? Would you stop this? God, God is on our Side, the land that we saw, Joshua and Caleb, the land that we saw, it's a land that's flowing with milk and honey. It's a land that is promised to us by God. And God's going to bring us into this land. He's going to give us this land that's flowing with milk and honey. And we're begging y'all, please stop rebelling. God is on our side. He's going to carry us. He's going to meet our need. He's going to see us through this moment. And once again, how do the people respond? Numbers chapter 14, verse number 10. All the congregation said, stone them with stones. Can you imagine what it was like in this moment to be in such a minority in God's covenant people? Anybody tracking with me? I mean, we got Moses, we got Aaron, we got Joshua, we got Caleb, and then there's everybody else. And God wanted me to stop right here today and to tell you that when you follow God completely and wholeheartedly, you had better get ready to be in a minority. 
you had better get ready for not everybody around you to pat you on the back and say amen and tell you how awesome you are. Many times God calls us to a place of loneliness. This, this, these, guys are, these guys are being courageous. Would you agree with me? Joshua and Caleb is being courageous. And, and they want to kill them just because, just because they're saying, let's follow God completely. Let's not back up. Let's not apologize. Let's trust Him. And this is a moment where the people wanted to kill Him. At this point, God has had enough. Read your Bible, Numbers 14. God is fed up. I mean, he is fed up. He says, Moses, I'm done. I'm done with this bunch. I fed them in the wilderness. I've taken care of them. I've met their need, and I'm done. Moses, I'm, doing, I'm pushing them away. I'm done with them. I'm going to create a new nation, and I'm going to bless another group of people who will follow me and trust me with all their heart. And Moses begins to intercede. And he says, God, please, you can't do that. The people know. The people of Egypt know your promises. They know your word. They know that you have made this covenant with your people, that you would never turn your back on them, and you would stay with them, and you would see them into the promised land. God, for your namesake, you can't turn and go away. And then verse number 18 of chapter 14, he begins to appeal on the, the nature of God, how that God is slow to anger, He's abounding in steadfast love that, 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 he, uh, is, uh, that he will visit the iniquity of the fathers of the children to the third and fourth generation. Verse 19, Moses says, please, God, please pardon them. Forgive them. I know they're hard-headed. But please, please, because of your steadfast love, don't turn your back on them. And here's God's response. All right. All right, Moses, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to forgive them, but here's the deal. To all of those who have seen my blessings, they've seen my miracles, they've seen my power in a supernatural way, every one of them are going to drop dead in the wilderness. They're not going into the promised land. Only the younger generation is going to get to pass into the promised land. I want you to look at verse 24, right after God says this. He focuses in on one dude. I love this. And he has something to say about Caleb. Now watch this, watch this. It's interesting that here in this moment, he doesn't say anything about Joshua. He doesn't mention him. Of course, God knows that Joshua is going to be the man, right? It's in this moment that God chooses to honor Caleb, to single out Caleb and his courage to do the right thing. And here's what God said about Caleb. Let me ask you, if, if God made one statement today about you and your life and your testimony and your faith, what would that statement be? If he made one statement about you or one statement about me. Here's what he has to say about Caleb. My servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me I will bring him into the land into which he went and his descendants shall possess it here is a blessing and a promise from God to Caleb because of Caleb's faithfulness to his God isn't that an interesting phrase y'all with me here for just a minute isn't that an interesting phrase because he has a different spirit. I mean, would, wouldn't it be cool if God said about me, Tim, Tim, he's got a different spirit. He's just got a different spirit. Wouldn't you want God to say that about you today? Wouldn't you? Man, he just got a different spirit. He's not bowed up in his spirit. He's not arrogant in his spirit. He's not self-centered. His spirit is humility. He's just different. He's got a different spirit. And here's his spirit. That's not Holy Spirit, by the way. That's a small s, spirit. His spirit is, I just want to follow God. I just want to be obedient to God. I want to do whatever it is that God calls me to do. And I can't be worried about the crowd. I can't be worried about opposition. I can't be worried about those that wag their finger at me. Because God has been faithful to me, and I want to be faithful to him. 
There's an important message here for the church today. The Bible says that you and I are on a very, very narrow way. I have been at times accused of being very narrow. And I want you to know I'm guilty. I'm very, very narrow. Jesus called it narrow. <laughs> so I'm going to call it narrow. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life everlasting. Friends, when you're on the narrow way, hear me now, please hear me. I don't want you to hear that we're all just going to get a martyr's complex because you and I today are not facing martyrdom. There are people in the world today who really are, who really are being persecuted. At the same time, I must remind you today that often when you just want to do what the Lord wants you to do and you want to stand on God's inspired, infallible Word and you want to obey Him and follow Him with all of your heart, there are going to be times when you feel in isolation and you feel lonely. Dale Davis put it this way, Sometimes courage in our faith leads to isolation in our faith. Courage in our faith leads to isolation in our faith. There are sometimes you will do what God asks you to do and you want to be obedient to Him and there will be people around you that will call you narrow-minded or they will accuse you of losing your mind. What I love about Caleb here is Caleb doesn't see which way the wind is blowing to make a decision about what God has already said. Somebody needs to say amen or oh me right there. Because we got a lot of winds blowing today. And I'm seeing a lot of Christians stick their finger up to see which way the wind's blowing to decide where they're going to stand and what they believe. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. What we need to do is be courageous enough to stand on it and to say, God has been faithful to us. How can I do anything but be faithful to Him? Sometimes when you do what God asks you to do, it's going to get you in trouble. I was reading this week a book by R.T. Kendall. You ought to read it. The book is Total Forgiveness. I'm telling you, that book is wrecking me. I'm just telling you it is. Total Forgiveness. And Dr. Kendall talks about his life. Somebody in the church did him wrong, did his family wrong, and, and uh, he was really struggling with that. And a man came into his life and said, you got one choice. you got to forgive, and this is how you forgive. And he begins to unpack forgiveness in that book, and he gets to a certain point, and he begins to unpack Joseph and his life and, and how his brothers uh, sold him into slavery. And then you know that story. He goes back to dad and says an animal attacked him. And then we fast forward all the way uh, to the end. And Joseph is a great leader in Egypt. And he's restored with his brothers. And he doesn't hold it against them. He forgives them and blesses them. And there's something that he says right in the middle of that narrative. Dr. Kendall says, when you think about Joseph's life, Joseph did right. He did exactly what God wanted him to do. And he got blessed by it by going to prison. Sometimes it'll cost you to do what God asks you to do. But you know what we see in the life of Caleb? We see a man that today, all these years later, he's a man that has a testimony of courage. Courage. Second thing, verse number 10, he has a testimony of God's sustaining grace. Look at verse number 10. Look at what he says. And now. And now. Verses 6 through 9, he's pointing back actually 45 years. But three times in verses 10 through 12, he says, And now, and now, 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 now behold, the Lord has kept me alive. Can anybody say amen right there? I mean, if you're alive today, look, he doesn't say protein shakes and vegetables. Nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with that. I'm not preaching against that. But how many of you believe the Lord has your days numbered? That's what the Bible says. Now, I'm not saying go eat a bunch of Whoppers today. I'm just saying. I'm just saying the Lord has your days numbered. 
There's no self-made man, self-made woman. You don't pick how long you live. You don't number your days. You don't schedule your life out. Caleb says, man, I've, I've been through a lot. I've seen a lot. I've done a lot. Here I am. Here I am. God has sustained me. God has kept me alive. Keep going. Just as he said, these 45 years since the time the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel walked in the wilderness. And now, and now, behold this day, I am 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then. For war and for going and for coming. So now, give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. I love this section right here because here's Caleb's testimony. He says, you know what? Hey, you remember Joshua? We was 40 years old. Remember? We went and scouted out the land. We came back. God did every bit of that. Here we are again, 45 years later. Caleb is 85 years old and this is his testimony. I'm just as strong today as I was then. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Pretty amazing. Some of you that are getting on up in years, you're going, whew, that, that's not me. I'm not as strong today as I was when I was 40. But you know what? I believe there's a message in this. The message is it doesn't matter how old you are today. If you're alive and you're breathing, God has a plan for your life. You say, I'm 70, I'm 75, 80, 85. Can, can you hear me today? God's not finished with you. He's given you strength for this day. He's given you breath in your lungs for this day. He's got something he wants you to do. You, you may not be able to do it in a way you did it years ago. You may not be able to flex like Caleb here. You know, I'm just as strong. Man, God had blessed this guy. He's, he's like ready to whoop a wildcat, right? I mean, notice he's talking about when they come into the land, and, 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 and he still says there's work here to be left done. Do you notice that verse number 12? He's going up to the hill country, and, and what most scholars believe is those giants were driven out down into the south and the east into Gaza, but some of them have found their way back into the land. We're going to see in just a minute that, that God blesses Caleb with the city of Hebron. No doubt there were some giants in the city of Hebron, and, and Caleb just says, you know what, I just happen to believe, maybe, just maybe, God's going to let me take them down too. And that was not a statement there of him doubting the Lord. It was a statement of humility. Here's what he was saying. He was saying, God brought me through all that other stuff, and I just got a sneaking suspicion he's going to bring me through whatever is ahead. Isn't it wonderful today to know that God is our sustainer? Look, there may be some tough days ahead for you. I was on the phone yesterday I'd, talking to some people in our church. There's some people in our church going through some tough days. I mean, I'm talking about some tough days. I'm not talking about having a, a little sinus issue to get through. I'm talking about tough days. Terminal illness in their body. And they don't know what the future is. But you know what a couple of them said to me? They don't know what the future is, but they know who's going into the future with them. They know what it means to live just every day, every day in, in God's sustaining grace Caleb said look at me Joshua here I am 45 years later God has brought me through he's given me my strength I still want to serve him and I still want to accomplish whatever he has for me now God's going to keep his promise to Caleb let me wrap this up God's going to keep his promise to Caleb in verse number 13 remember I read just a minute ago numbers 14 24 he had the right spirit, and God said, man, I'm going to give him. I'm going to give him some land. Notice what he does in verse number 13. Joshua blesses Caleb. He blesses him. Notice he gave him Hebron. He gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jehunah, for an inheritance. Therefore, Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jehunah, the Kenizzite, to this day. Why? Because he wholly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. I love verse 15. God has a sense of humor. Now the name of Hebron, formerly 
as Kiriath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. And the land had rest from war. The blessing that Caleb receives from God for his faithfulness is he receives the city of Hebron. Hebron was formerly named Arba, which was the name of the biggest, baddest dude among the Anakims. Do you not see God's humor in that? Caleb, I'm going to give you the city that was named after the bad guy. God's blessings on his life. You need to read Numbers chapter, I'm sorry, Joshua chapter 15. And you'll see that once Caleb receives the city of Hebron, he's able to also bless, pass down and bless his family. His daughter asks for a blessing and he gives her an area with springs and he's able to pass down the blessings of God. And I want you to see this. 45 years he had to wait to experience the land. And many scholars say it was probably five to seven years once they got into the land before Caleb received the city of Hebron. But yet God kept his word. Some of you today may be waiting. You may be waiting and you wonder if God's going to come through. And God just sent me here today to tell you God always keeps his word. When he says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. And Caleb receives the blessing. I think about our own life today. How many of you in the room have a testimony that, that God's been good to you and God's blessed you? It, look, it, look, it's probably not a parcel of land, even though maybe you do have some. I don't know. It's probably not a parcel of land. Your blessing is not in the land, but your blessing is in the Lord. God sent us his very best when he sent us his son, the Lord Jesus. And I love the way the Apostle Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Matter of fact, I said it to somebody this week that I was talking with in a, in a counseling moment. Look on the screen, Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. If you were to lose everything today, my question, not the church answer, but your life, your life today, could you say that if I lost everything, but I have Jesus, Jesus is enough? This past Sunday night over at Olive Baptist, Pastor Trailer, he sent me a link, actually Monday morning, Vance Pittman is the a president of SIN North America, the, the church planning arm of our North American Mission Board of the SBC. And he preached over at Olive Baptist last Sunday night. And so uh, I, I went and I listened to his sermon and I sent it out to our guys in the leadership pipeline yesterday. I hope they'll listen to it. But Vance is just talking about his, his own journey with the Lord and getting into pastoring and, and uh, how he was leading a church and the church he was at was growing and, and the Lord and people were coming and being saved and baptized, and he just felt like everything was going great until he realized that uh, he wasn't the pastor, the deacons were the pastor. And so that sent him into this really hard time in his life, and he said he just he, the church was out of the picture now, and he was on his own. And he said what the Lord carried him into was a season in his life where he didn't have his position, he didn't have a pastorate, he didn't have a ministry job, and he said the Lord showed him that his identity and his relationship with the Lord was not about ministry. It was about intimacy. Intimacy with the Lord. To truly be able to say that Jesus is enough. If I have nothing else in this life, but I have Jesus, I'm a blessed man. Peter put it this way, 1 Peter chapter 1. Look, and I'm, I'm going to close. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3. Peter said this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance. 
that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading. It's kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Friends, remember that the call to follow Christ and to be faithful to Him is not a life of ease. But we rejoice today because we have the blessing of knowing Christ and we know that we have an inheritance that will never be taken away from us. So what God wants us to do today is to rejoice and be thankful in His blessings. But yet we get distracted by the naysayers. We get distracted by the crowd who says, fire them, stone them. We don't want to hear what you've got to say. And God is calling you and I today as proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus Christ to be faithful to Him until our last breath. We believe that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That He was buried, He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That on the cross, He took all of our hurts, all of our habits, all of our hang-ups in Himself on the tree. He took my sin and His body on the tree. So that, praise God, by His grace, when I was 13 years old, I acknowledged that I was a sinner. I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. I confessed my sin and confessed Him as Lord. Hear me, I, I really believe it was, it was a time in my life when I already knew about the cross, but it was a time in my life where I understood the cross and I understood that Jesus died in my place. What a blessing today to know that I'm in Jesus and He's in me. For someone who came to this earth to be faithful to the will of the Father, to die in my place. How can I not, like Caleb, have courage and thanksgiving and gratitude and let the blessings in my life come not from this chaotic world, but to let them come from Him, who is the giver of all things. And God's people said, would you stand with me in a moment of prayer? and reflection. Maybe today Satan has got a foothold in your life to where you've not been really thankful. You've not been living in the spirit of gratitude. God just reminded you today that you're blessed. That He sustained you. You know it's interesting over in chapter 17, verses 14 to 18, there's a little section there where some of the tribes complain. They complain about their land. It's not enough. It's not big enough. You bless them better than you blessed us. There's a reason why the New Testament says don't compare ourselves among ourselves. We are all blessed by God. We're blessed. Maybe today you're not living in those blessings. Maybe today... You've never truly repented of your sins, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, confessed Him as Lord. We pray that today would be your day of salvation. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, let him that is thirsty come and drink of the water of life freely. In a spirit of prayer, I wonder how many in the room today would say, Pastor, I, I've got to be honest. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I'm a Christian. I'm not sure that my relationship with God is right. I'm, I'm just not sure about that, and, and, and I'm concerned about it. I want to ask you to pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? I'm the only one looking around the room. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I do want to pray for you. Is there anybody like that? Pastor, would you remember me in prayer today? Would you close the service? I'm not sure. I'm not sure about my salvation. I'm not sure that I'm a Christian, and I want you to pray for me. Anybody? Anybody across the room? I don't see any hands. I automatically assume that most of us come to church on Sunday because we have a profession of faith in Christ. 
And I think today's one of those sermons where it's not one of those where you say, well, yeah, they really needed that. Or, I'm glad they were here. <laughs> this is one of those sermons where we are all equal. We're all equal in the culture and the world that we're living in right now. We are being put to the test. Will we remain faithful to our Lord? Will we have courage? Will we boldly proclaim the truth of the gospel? Oh, how Caleb has encouraged me. I hope he has you today. You know, the real message of Joshua 14 is not the faithfulness of Caleb, but it's the faithfulness of our God, that God is faithful to us. How can we not be faithful?